All right, so we got that going. No, that's whoever's the place we just get the one. Oh, you want to do that? It's not saying me. What do you want to have? What's the criteria for having fun? Oh, okay. Everything we do is made up. Easy <laughs> cameras. How are you? Go ahead. And examine the train. Right. Well, it's time to get started. Um, so what we're going to do today is we I am going to get started with um, the exam from 2022 fall. And it is recording right now, although it's probably not recording from where I wanted to record from, because right now the mic is on using the, uh, the built in mic on my laptop, which is not ideal, because you know, that means you know, every time I type something, it's gonna, I mean, that's gonna, it's gonna be very audible. So I am reconfiguring Zoom to make use of the other mic, the one on the table on the other side. So give me a second to change that. All right, now where am I going to make those changes? Let's mute, and I don't wanna change that. I'm just trying to find the place to change that. No, yeah, I can change it somewhere else. Give me a second. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, it's already using the other mic. Okay, never mind. All right. So, and I got my stylus. I went back to uh, Rave Hall and reclaim my little stylus thing. All right, so for questions one to five, they are related. They're all asking for relations, you know, type of answers. So in this case, I give you the relation itself and you need to tell me whether it is you know, reflexive, symmetric, anti-symmetric, transitive, and uh, comparable or not. And if it is not, you have to tell me exactly why it is not. If it is, you just say true, and that will be the end of that particular section. And also, as you can see, each, each uh, subpart has a different percentage because some of these are easier to do than others, and therefore you know, they are not uh, evenly distributed. So we're gonna get started with this one. You know, R is 0, 0, 0, 2, 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, 1, and 2, 2 as two tuples in a set. The question is, is this particular relation reflexive over X? X has zero, one, and two in it. So what do you think? I see a lot of people nodding. That's good because it is reflexive. So I can now just right here and just I, it, be careful because my little cooler thing is down here. And then with my keyboard on the side, you just have to say it is true in this case. The next question to ask, is it symmetric? So we look at this and go like, hmm, that's pretty, it's very unsymmetric or very asymmetric. But now the answer is, it's not just false, okay? You have to indicate the answer is false, but then you also have to tell me why it is false. So the question now is, uh, am I supposed to tell you that it is false? Well, the, it is a part of, in the question already, uh, if a property you know, applies to relation defined over X, blah, 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 and it is not true, then you have to tell me what condition is gonna cause it not to be true. And also what is the expression that is not true in this case. So then you have to say, in this case, I, can, I have a few examples. So the answer doesn't even have to be unique. So I can say if E is zero, F is two, then, uh, e, F, if and only if F, E is false, okay? 
because that explains you know, exactly why it is not symmetric. If I substitute E with zero and I substitute F with two, then the property that I need to be true, no matter which E or F I'm choosing that needs to be true is now false. And in a universally quantified statement, I only need one single instance for that thing to be false for the quantified statement to be false. So do we have any questions about the format of this particular answer? In addition to why it is not symmetric. Any questions? Nope, okay, all right. And I'm just gonna double check on Zoom a little bit to make sure that I don't have anyone waiting in the waiting room. And I do not, okay, very good. All right, next one is anti-symmetric. So the question is, is this anti-symmetric? The answer is, it is anti-symmetric, okay? So let me write down the right answer first. It is true, it is indeed anti-symmetric. So if you think it is not anti-symmetric, then you have to tell me why you're thinking that it is not anti-symmetric. Because if you let me know why you think it is not anti-symmetric, then I can, you know, I can try to diagnose you know, where your misunderstanding is. Are you good? Are you good? Okay. So in this case, it is uh, it is anti-symmetric. Next one up is uh, transitive. The question is: Is this relation transitive? So that one I have to take a look first. Uh, the two one one zero. Oh, there we go. So we have two one. We have one zero, but two zero is missing. So it is not transitive. So we answer false, or I can just type the answer too. It's easier for me just to type it. Assuming this tool works because there are a few times I try to use this tool, the text tool, and it's not working like now. Okay, never mind. I have to switch back to the pencil tool. There we go. Okay, so we have to say false. Okay, so you say when E equals to two, F equals to one and then g equals to zero, then um, e, f, oh, okay, never mind. I forgot about e, e and r here. Okay, there we go. So e, f, in r is true. Uh, f, g, in r is also true, but implying that e, g is in r, the implication itself is false. So are we good so far? All right. So in order to write the answer like this, in order to understand the answer like this, you do have to understand what does it mean when you have you know, when, we, when we're calling a relation transitive. So the definitions of these relate of these properties of a relation is super duper important. All right. But the nice part is the, um, the properties are actually already given up here. Um, so you can refer to A, B, C, D, E, you know, which one is false and what variable you, know, you can use to make it false. So there we go. All right, so getting back to, yep. So what are the chances that the, uh, the, each of the rules will be on the uh, actual I do not know yet, since I do not I do not have the question for this semester. But since this is a test, this is this is an assessment to see whether we understand all of these concepts or not. You can probably assume it is one hundred percent that everything that was ever talked about in lecture is within the scope, and you have to prepare that they are all in the test. That's how you prepare for a test. You do not you. Know, want to kind of make assumptions about, well, I think this is not going to be on the test and you will know, not study that. Yep. Can you go with the anti-symmetric one? Anti-symmetry, yeah. okay. So, so instead of doing that, let's go back and see if we can find where in the modules we talked about um, anti-symmetry because that's much more important than just me talking about anti-symmetry again. And I cannot show you the gray book. 
Um, okay, so let me close this tab and then I don't have another tab you know, with access to Canvas. All right, that's fine. I'm just going to go here again. Instructor. This is this one goes to a different class. All right, I don't have any quick way to get back into Canvas. All right, so that particular question is reminding me to tell you guys that this exam is open book and open notes. So that means uh, the first thing you probably want to do, let me click that first, is to review the notes so that you know what is available and what is within the scope of this exam. And then you, know, you have to kind of think about, do you want to print all the modules that I have written? Or do you want to prepare your own written material that you want to bring to the test? You can do both, okay? You know, if you want to be absolutely sure, do both, okay? The advantage of preparing your own material and bring it to the test is you are already studying once as you're preparing that material. And because you are writing that material, the chances of you knowing where to find something is pretty good, okay? It's very efficient as opposed to finding where I will refer to something because you didn't write my, write my material. So the chances of you remembering exactly where to look for it is much is lower. So we are talking about relations and in relations, we talked about all of these properties. And I think the question was about anti-symmetry. So here it is. So anti-symmetric is defined as a relation R, which is basically a set of two tuples, which is a subset of the Cartesian product between X and itself. And it has to meet this particular requirement. So for all ways to choose E as an element in X, F as an element in X, EF in R, FE in R has to imply that EF, E equals to F. And that one is true, no matter which E or F you choose in the example that we were looking at. And someone is trying to join us. All right. All right, so let me switch back to the test itself. And I, let me see if there are any questions about this specific example. And let me get back to here and scroll up a little bit so that we can see the original question itself. There we go. Okay, so questions. Okay, so this is the anti-symmetry, so how this is the implication from the implication. So the implication is the last operator. So if I go back to the definition, this is how it's defined. So this universally quantified statement is true if and only if R is anti-symmetric over X. So, I mean, this is the most precise way to define it. So now the question is, are we understanding what the universally quantified statement is really saying? And try to apply that also to the example that we were looking at, you know, in the in the in the exam two. Okay, so I mean, are you doing okay, you know, with this statement? Yeah. Can you find it on the browser on your browser? Right. Find the, uh, the notes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I just want to make sure that you have it on your screen as I switch over to this part here because this particular relation R is anti-symmetric. Yes. Say that again. All E such that F is in straight. All E. For example, I just want to like clarify that says all E such that F is in all. You mean for this one? Yeah. yeah. That one says you know, for every way to choose E and for every way to choose F, E R F and F R E has to be true. Now, does that correspond to one of the property of relations that we have talked about? The answer is no. 
that's why it's used as an example. And that's also why the property is called the UUP, which is utterly useless property. <laughs> it's just an example. That's all it is. It, that one is just an example to say that, you know, if the property is defined this way, what kind of answer am I expecting? So it's about the format of the answer, not about the meaning of the various properties that we actually care about in this question. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. What, what, what is it? Is there a way to look for transitivity like faster and not you don't have just be really to be relevant? Um, well, I suppose, well, we haven't really talked about any algorithm to test for each one, uh, but we did talk about the universally quantified statement. Yeah, I know that, but how would I? So what are the methods? How, how can I choose E, F, and G? There are tons of different options. The best way to describe my algorithm is eyeball. If you want to use an actual algorithm, it will be a triple loop. So for every way to choose E inside that loop, for every way to choose F, I would mean for every way to choose G, you test, you pass it through this test here and see if the implication is true or not. So, so there's no there's no shortcut shortcut. I mean, it really depends on how well you know <clears throat> these properties. And that's why if we go over this particular exam to give you guys an idea of you know what you need to do in the test. So it's supposed to be done manually. Any other questions? I think it's manageable manually. Okay. It's just that you have to practice a few times so that you know what to look for. Yep. Sorry, it's been a bit. For, when you say for every that means um it's an exhaustive list like all of the all of the um variables have to follow that rule. Uh, so you're asking a question regarding universal quantifier. So to answer that question, I know this may not be the best answer or one that people want to hear me to refer to, but this is one way to define, you know, for all E in X, you know, some kind of predicate F applied to E. So it is basically a conjunction of, you know, for every way to choose an element out of X, you're just ending f of e across all of those things. It's been a bit. Is for well, like symmetric and anti-symmetric, is it an exhaustive list or do you have to find one example? Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking, but let me go back to the module and you can tell me what you're asking. It's a bit time. I think I asked the same question in the first place. It was like, um, do you have to find only one example that fits it and therefore makes it true? Or does every um, element have to fit it? And if you- Okay, so what does it mean when I when I say, you know, universal quanti universally quantified? What does that mean? Yep. That is correct. It, exactly, it is that uh, you, so if you consider innocence as true, guilty as false, this is basically saying you know, someone remains innocent until proven guilty. So you have to have evidence of the guilt. It only needs to be one, right? In order for the court to convict someone to be guilty. But in the lack of any evidence, that person is innocent. So in the, in the universally quantified expression, it means you know, the, the, the statement is true by default, unless you can find a specific example to make the quantified statement itself false. So that's, uh, we introduced that concept in week one or two. So you know, this is a very, very important concept to understand. We are using that concept all the way throughout this semester. The universally quantified statement or the for all is the same thing as every in English. And then the other one, which is called the existentially quantified deal statement is the same thing as what we say when we say some or at least one, 
that uh, corresponds to their existence. So this is something that uh, that requires a little bit of review. Okay, so if you're kind of shaky on the concept of what it means, I would encourage you to come, you know, talk to me during my office hours. All right, is that okay so far? Now, since these concepts are not something that I invented in my class, like you know the architecture in CISP 310, you can look this up on Wikipedia. You can even ask ChatGPT to explain what is a universal quantifier to you or, and what is an existential quantifier. This is kind of nice because I can offload my own teaching to ChatGPT. I have my own TA now. I wouldn't trust ChatGPT with man. <laughs> no, no, no. But for something like this, I think it does a fair, fairly easy job. This is a, this is not something that's really kind of oddball and only used occasionally. All right. So, shall we move on? Okay. So we are moving on to com comparable. So comparable in this case, let me check. So zero is fine. One is fine, two is fine as well. So it is comparable. There we go. So that is true as well. All right, any questions? Okay, so someone is probably trying to think, what is comparable? Comparable is defined in this module as well. So if I go down a little bit more, comparable is defined down here. R is comparable over X, meaning that for all EF in X, ERF or FRE. So in this case, you know, this universally quantified statement is indeed true. It doesn't matter what you choose as E, it does not matter what you choose as F, the disjunction is always true. Are we okay so far? Okay, cool. <clears throat> All right, so my original hope was you know, by giving you guys the practice exam a little bit early, um, I was hoping that people would actually try to study and actually try to take the practice exam on their own to kind of get a quick you know, self-assessment of, am I getting these concepts? Or at least you know, I can write down the answer and then compare that with the answer that I'll be talking about in class. So that was my original intention of sharing the exam from fall 2022. Um, so whether that it works the way I expect it or not, may or may not be the case. <laughs> that, that's a good idea, but the thing problem is, you need, if I have four tests, mm -hmm. they all fall in the same week. If I have taken four subjects, they all fall in the same week. Ah. So you don't have So it's time. about, it's it's a question about. I my test next term, so I can't do anything about it. I have, a, I have an answer to that one too. And people may or may not like, like that answer, but I'm going to share anyway. Um, it is a matter of budgeting your time. So it depends on how many classes you're taking. Um, I have known people who try to take 21, 22 units per semester. So in that case, it becomes impossible. It becomes impossible to properly prepare for every single exam for every single class because you know, there's not enough money. There's not enough time in the budget to do that. So some of it is a budgeting issue, you know, and the other one is, yeah, I understand that sometimes you know, it just so happens that all the exams fall into the same week, you know, occasionally in the same, on the same day. So I understand that part too. All right, so let me go back to the exam and we'll go to the second example. So there we go. So I'm hoping this will at least tell people what they need to study because when, you know, when people look at this question, they go like, I have no idea what is, let's just say transitive, okay? Well, that means, you know, one, that person needs to know where to find the definition, which I think is a good idea to reread it the entire module. Um, two is to say, hmm, do I want to print this entire module out to take with me to the, to the exam? Maybe, maybe not, okay? Some people may look at my writing and go like, okay, that's gibberish. I can write so much better than tech, but go ahead and write your own notes, okay? Make it more concise, make it the way that you know how to read and, you know, put things where you know where to find. Yes? So I know that 
for example, two, two halves relate to zero, you know, mm -hmm. but does two have to relate to two? Well, that's an interesting question. Let's see if the definition answers that question. So this is important because you know, whenever we have a question like that, it is important to go back to the definition and ask, according to the definition, in this scenario, would that be the case or not? So in this case, if E is 2, F is 2, then we are evaluating whether 2 R2 or 2 R2 is true or not. So that means if the 2, 2, 2 tuple is missing, then 2 is indeed in X, then you have false or false, which means the entire thing is going to be false. And as a result, the lack of 2, 2 as a 2 tuple will make the relation R not comparable, comparable anymore. Technically, reflexivity is like a prerequisite to comfortability. Yes, it is. Yep, that is true. <clears throat> but when you answer questions like this one, like you know, the uh, the one that we are talking about, you do not want to use since it is not reflexive and therefore it is not comparable as an answer because you need to refer back to the comparable definition itself. But you are correct. If something is not reflexive, it is also auto automatically not comparable. That is correct. All right. Any other questions here you know, about number one? All right, moving on to number two. Let's see whether we can uh, pick up the pace. Number two. All right, so here's number two, kind of the same deal, except, you know, well, is it reflexive? Is it symmetric? Is it anti-symmetric? Is it transitive? And is it comparable? And this time I think I'm gonna, well, maybe not. Okay, never mind. All right, so first of all, is it reflexive? So let's see. Zero, zero is here, one, one is here, two, two is here. So it is indeed reflexive. So if the answer is true, I don't have anything else that I need to do. Is it symmetric? Zero, zero, you know, has a mirror of zero, zero, it's all good. Zero, two has a mirror of two, zero, it's here. One, one has a mirror of itself. Two, two has a mirror of itself. So it is indeed symmetric. Are we good so far? Any questions up to this point? No, okay. Um, is it anti-symmetric? The answer is no, it is not anti-symmetric. So if it is not anti-symmetric or if one of the property is false, since all of the properties make use of universally quantified statements, then all you need to say is to say, okay, according to the definition, which involves E and F, if I choose E to be this and F to be that, this expression is gonna be false. That is what I'm expecting you guys to you know, use as an explanation. So in this case, if I make E equal to one, oops, zero, okay zero, I make F equal to two, then <clears throat> EF is in R and FE is in R. This conjunction is true. On the other hand, E equals to F is false. So that means this entire thing is false. In other words, the statement that is quantified in the definition of anti-symmetry is false. I can find at least one instance to make it false, and therefore the universally quantified statement itself is false. Are we doing okay so far with this one? So to get this one, okay, I can also break down the elemental concepts that you need to understand. Uh, the universal quantifier is really important, okay? And the second one has to do with implication. <clears throat> the concept of implication is also very important because in this case, do we have, okay, if E is zero, F is two, do we have ER in R, EF in R? Yes, you can see zero, two here. Do we have two zero in here, in R? Yes, right? So that means the conjunction is going to be true, which means the left hand side of implication is true. But on the other hand, is zero and two the same thing? No. No. So the right hand side of the implication is false. 
So when you have an implication where the left-hand side is true, but the right-hand side is false, the implication itself is false. How do we know that? The truth table from week one. Yes. Hmm? Uh, saying the truth table not x or r. Correct. That will that will work as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. So is that okay so far? Okay, because I'm trying to break it down. You know what you need to understand first before you even try to understand the definition of anti-symmetry in this case. All right. So is it transitive? The answer is yes. It is transitive. You cannot use a single instance to show that it is not. And then the last one is, is it comparable? I believe it is not comparable because zero does not relate to one at all. One does not relate to two. And one does not relate to two. So there are multiple answers. You only have to give me one single instance because in order for a universally quantified statement to be false, that statement only has to be false for at least one case of all the possible cases. So in this case, it is false. And I can say E is zero and F is one. And then I can say uh, E, F in R or F E in R, that whole disjunction is false. Is that okay so far? Okay, all right. So let's move on to the next case. All right, so question number three is also you know, the same kind of question, except the R or the relation itself is awfully simple this time. R only has zero, zero as a two tuple in it. So let's go check out all the points here. It is not reflexive, okay, because it is missing some of the other pairs of um, tuples. But you don't want to just say, oh, it's missing one one, okay, because it's missing one one is not enough to make a connection back to the definition of being reflexive. So what you want to do is to say when E equals to one, E, E in R is false because this is the statement being quantified. And since I can find one instance, at least one instance where the statement is false, that makes the universally quantified statement itself false. So that's why you're just saying that uh, one one is missing is insufficient to answer this question. All right, is it symmetric? Yep, it is symmetric. Is it anti-symmetric? Yes, it is anti-symmetric. Is it transitive? Yes but it is not comparable. And once again, you can say E equals to one, F equals to one too, because in this case, you want to tell me that E R F or F R E is false. So we can use either notation because E comma E as a two tuple in R is really the same thing as E R E. It's just a different type of notation. Yep. Since you said that, that it has to be reflective, going to be comparable? Could we theoretically say because it is not reflexive, it can be comparable? You cannot use that in it as an explanation because the explanation has to connect back to the um, definition of comparable okay. in this case. All righty. Any other, any questions about number three? So we have seen three examples of the same type of question. Let's check out the next one. So the next one is a little bit longer. It's got a lot of stuff in it. So the first one is, is it reflexive? We got zero, zero, we got one, one, we got two, two, and X only has zero, one, two in it. So it is indeed reflexive. Is it symmetric? It is not symmetric because if E equals to zero and F equals one, then E R F, if and only if F R E is false, okay? If and only if is li literally as what it sounds like. It means, you know, the implication has to go both ways. All right, next one, anti-symmetric. Anti-symmetry is the anti-symmetric. 
So let me take a quick look here. It is not anti-symmetric. So in this case, if E is one, F is two, then we have E R F and F R E implying E equals to F being false. All right, next one up is transitive. Is it transitive? So let me take a look. So we got two, one, okay, that won't help us here. We got zero, one, one, two, zero, two is here already. So it looks, it looks to me that it is indeed transitive. Yep. Zero, one, zero, one, and oh, no. Yeah, zero, one, one, two, using one as a bridge, but zero, two is here already. So zero, one, and then one, one. And zero one is one. Then you have, then you're looking for zero one as a result, and zero one is here already. Yeah. So the only other one is um, zero two and then two one, but zero one is also here already. So that doesn't prove it is not the case. Um, I don't think it is not anti symmetric, uh, not transitive. So it is transitive in this case. <clears throat> So just put a T here, and it, is it comparable? Okay, zero matches zero, one, and two. One is related to one, is related to zero, is related to two. Okay, that's good. And two is the same way, so that means it is indeed comparable, like so. All right, any questions about this particular one? Okay. And, oh, okay, I forgot to take roll. So let's go ahead and take roll first because I haven't taken roll in this class, this particular class for a while. So it's time to kind of resume doing that. All right, so we are, you cannot see it yet. You know, so give me a moment here to adjust the time when you can turn in your answer. So we'll go to edit. And I'm kind of glad that I didn't do it earlier because people were still streaming in at that time. The um, access code is reflexive. And I'll give you guys until 12.50 PM. Save and publish. There we go. And once again, the access code is reflexive. So with that said, so for those of you who are done with uh, road taking, um, the college ARC, I think the entire Los Reels, is considering to offer non-credit classes. So non-credit class has a few advantages. One, it is free, as in like totally free. So there's no per unit charge. Uh, two, um, you can retake it as many times as you want because there's no grade. So it's a pass, no pass kind of deal, okay? So the question is, you know, you guys can think about it. You don't have to tell me your answer right away is what do you feel about non-credit classes? So the bottom line is uh, we are also going to have a way to convert non-credit classes back into four credit classes. So let's just say that someone, you know, have, have, has, has heard about me teaching CISB 440 and go like, oh, that's going to be a tough, tough class. Okay. I might want to take it as a non credit class. Okay. So you take it as a non credit class and maybe you just kind of go like, okay, this is not for me. I do not have to pay a penny. And I just kind of you know, drop out in the middle of the semester. But it has no impact to your transcript because it is it's a non credit class. It doesn't, even, it does not even show up. Okay. So you take it again and again. So maybe the fourth time <laughs> you finally go like, I'm feeling pretty good about this one. In fact, I'm getting an A if I were, if I took this class 
for credit. So what you do after that is you go to um, admission and records, okay? And you just say, okay, I took this class as a non-credit class, but I want to convert it to a full credit class. So in that process, the professor, me, you know, can look up your actual score, your actual grade. If you were to take it for credit and go like, yep, that person got an A in this class, you know, when that person was taking this class you know, as a non-credit class. So that basically gives people an unlimited number of tries you know, before they get it and then convert it back to full credit class. Yep. But all that time they were taking it for free? Supposedly, yes. <laughs> Since I do not use a textbook, so there's no textbook fee, the only thing you'll be paying for would be the paper on which you print the modules for the um, you know, in-person tests. So he, him first and then you. Okay, go ahead. So I'm wondering why you would ever take a four credit class then if you can just convert it and yeah. it doesn't cost you money. But it's an extra step. See, that's the thing. It is yeah. an extra step. But then you also have a, if I do bad, then it doesn't reflect in my records. But you also have to have the college to offer that class as a non-credit class. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. So, so the, the college, specific. yeah, there are specific okay. classes. Yep. Okay. You, you first. No, I'm good. You're good. Okay, go ahead. I feel like the reason they get it, I feel like they're not going to count towards financial aid. So, but there won't be any expenses related to the tuition right, fee. Right, but if you want to specific, if, if you're going to be spending the time in the class, that is correct. You don't want it to overlap with anything. That is correct. You need their credit hours to get this specific amount so you can get like full time financial aid. Mm -hmm. So you'd be sacrificing having more work because you have all the actual core credit classes and yep. then the non credit class. <laughs> Assuming it doesn't count towards the time, which I assume would be the case. I don't yep. know why they would count it if you weren't going to be paying. And this class, you know, this specific class is probably does not even qualify. That the college won't offer it as a non credit class mm -hmm. because the two types of non credit classes where the college would get funded as if it is a four credit class. One would be basic skills. So that would be your pre-calculus, uh, pre-algebra kind of math classes. And then the second type would be classes that can lead to um, you know, career advancement like right away. So very specific programming languages on the other hand will qualify as a non-credit class. So this is one single class that would teach you how to use JavaScript to have you know, one web server to communicate with other you know, you know, servers using REST. That would be a good choice as a non-credit class because it is not really that academic, but at the same time, if your employer says, okay, this is the kind of scripting I want you to do, hey, that fits the need right away. So, so interesting things you're know, coming you know, our way, but this, I was just using this class in, in, as an example. It's unlikely that this class will be offered as a non-credit class. Sorry to get your hopes up, but you're in this class already. So you know, it doesn't really matter to you. So how can they check which classes are offered? Huh? How can they check it? Um, yeah. Well, we are way, you know, we are still really just kind of talking about it right oh. now. So it's going to be at least five more years. <laughs> at least. And I said at least five more years before it becomes reality. <clears throat> but this district is the only district of the entire California that does not have non-credit classes. Yeah. It's kind of odd, right? All right, so one last one before we move on to a different type of uh, questions. So in this one, okay, let's try to get to the answers as quickly as possible. It is not reflexive because um, when E equals to one, E R E is false, okay? Okay, next, is it symmetric? It is not symmetric because when E equals to zero and F equals to two, E R F, if and only if F R E is false. Is it anti-symmetric? It is definitely not anti-symmetric. Oops, so I just click the button because when E equals to zero and F equals to one, then E, R, F, and F, R, E, the whole thing implies E equals to F is false. All right, is it transitive? 
mm, it is not transitive for sure, because when E equals to one, F equals to zero, and G equals to one again, then E R F and F R G implies E R G is false. Is it comparable? Definitely not. <laughs> But then I have to be specific about the answer because in this case, when E equals one, F equals one, then E R F or F R E is false. There we go. So even though this particular format of an answer does take a little bit more writing, as you can see, it doesn't take that much time. So the time is mostly about interpreting the relation R itself and relating what you're seeing as an example to the definitions. So as a result, okay, as a result of that, understanding the definitions is the key to get these things done quickly. So how do you study? There are many ways to study for this test, but something like this, okay? I want you guys to come up with examples, okay? Come up with your own relation and then come up with your own conclusion. And then you can say, but I'm not sure about this one. These I'm really sure, but I'm not sure about this one. Then you can ask me, you can come to my office hour, show me the example that you have worked out and go like, I think this one is not transitive because blah, blah, blah. But can you take a look and see if that is the case or not, okay? So that would be a good use of you know, um, office hour, or you can turn it, you, know, you, can, you can email that to me and I can turn it back to you within a day or so. But that would be a good way to you know, study for this test is for you to come up with examples of it is transitive, this one is, this, this one is not. This one is anti-symmetric, this one is not, and so on, yep. The test is Monday, that is correct, not Wednesday, because I have, I'm have i on an interview panel on Wednesday, so I won't be here, but I will prepare a, an 80 minute uh, lecture pre-recorded for this class, but you don't have to be here to watch it, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Okay, so this one is a new question compared to all the previous semesters. So what is known to be true is given as a predicate psi, a function that returns a Boolean result. The following truth table describes the function. So the function requires three parameters, P, Q, and R, and I give you the correct answer or the answer to each one of those. And then the question proceeds to ask, uh, given this truth table, derive the CNF corresponding to psi. You can use Boolean algebra and any reasoning that has been discussed in class, but you must follow, show the steps and reasoning. So let's get this part, uh, let's get this, uh, let's get this part done first. Okay, there we go. All right, so how would you do it? There are a few ways to do it. Um, as a CNF, um, it means it's a conjunction of terms. So one way to do it is to look at all the rows that has false as the result. And then what you want to do is to turn each one of those false into a disjunction that is false for that row and that row only. And then the conjunction of all of those disjunctions is going to be the answer. The question did not even ask you to simplify as much as you can. It simply says, turn it into a CNF. Okay, so do you guys vaguely remember how to do that? Okay, so I'll give you uh, a few examples. On the first row, P, Q, R are ones, but the result is a false. So the question is, how do you make a disjunction uh, or using the variables P, Q, R such that the or is a false, but only for this particular row? Not P, not Q, not R, but what type of operator connects them? Or, very good, okay. So this one is not P or not Q or not R. Uh, the second row has a result of one, so we don't do anything with it, okay? We just leave it alone. Um, and then there are ways to kind of shortcut a little bit here. 
So if I were to look at these four rows, okay, this entire block of four rows, what do I see? They're all false, okay? But what else do I see, you know, uh, that can kind of help me with, you know, getting this done quickly? What is common about these four rows? Hmm? They're all false, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So each one, you know, is its own statement, okay? But is there a way to look at this and quickly come up with um, the solution? Does it matter what R is? Does it seem to you that R matters at all for these four rows? Look at every single case when R is true. Uh, it's false. Look at R when it's, uh, it's false too. So it doesn't, it doesn't seem to me whether R is true or false or not make a difference, right? So then you can now focus on the other two variables, P and Q. So it looks like if at least one of them is true and the other one is false, then the answer is gonna be false. So that means I can now simplify and look at the first two and say, in this one, as long as I negate P and then or that with Q and uh, not uh, negated, this is gonna be false, but only for these two rows. Mm -hmm. And then I can look at these two and I can say, okay, use P as is, but negate Q. That disjunction is false, but only for these two rows. Yep. So what if we did this go beyond? Would that technically be correct? That would technically be correct, but you'd be spending more time to write. So it's up to you. I mean, the trade-off is, you know, individual. It so would you have to simplify? No, you do not have to simplify. And then we have the last row, which is just P or Q or R. So each one is a disjunction. So you, when you make a conjunction out of these four disjunctions, that's a CNF, you're done. Are we, are we doing okay so far with this technique? Now, this one looks so simple, right? You guys are all saying, so we could have done the same thing with our homework assignment. You could, but our homework assignment has five variables. So you'd be looking at the truth table with 32 rows. And I think those things are scattered, you know, a little bit. So that means, you know, it may not be <laughs> saving you a whole lot of time either. So in terms of deriving the CNF, yes. It would be okay if we individually did each. Yeah, that would be fine too. Yep, that would also be fine. Okay. All right, so I have just you know, done this part here, given this truth table, derive the CNF corresponding to this thing here. So we can say you know, this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing, done. All right, so moving on. So knowing that um, psi of this is converted to this, okay? In other words, I'm giving you the answer already, okay? This is the same thing as what we saw on the, on the whiteboard, or at least it's equivalent. Okay. Your answer must forward derive from the truth table to the CNF and not a verification that the truth table is consistent with the CNF. In other words, in the very same question, I give you the CNF already, <clears throat> but I'm also asking you to show me how to derive it. Okay. You can think of it as um, I show you where you are. I can show you where you need to be and you need to tell me what route you're going to take to get there, okay? So just you can, you can, you can do that, yeah? You can also use uh, some other means. In other words, start with what is given in the truth table, apply Boolean algaga, <laughs> <laughs> algebra, and logic to figure out the CNF. Explain the CNF using the truth table, not the other way around, okay? So now that I have my CNF derived like this, how do I get to this form here? All right. All right, so let's go back to here. So can we perform? So absorption is not doable. What technique uh, can we use here? So you can see how P or Q or R it's just your Q or R, so P is gone. So how did we get rid, get rid of P? I think resolution can help us in here. 
this cube up here. Because if you resolve this one or this one, then he's gone. So we so that's how we get rid of P or Q or R and only have Q or R left. And then we also have not Q, not P or not P or Q completely gone. Not P or Q, which is this one, completely gone. So how do we get it to go away entirely? Hmm? What is the question? Okay, so if you look at the solution here, we explain how we can get you know, just an or R, right? So it's by resolution. This one is in here already, so not the problem. So the question is in uh, this one here, not P or not R. If you write the R on the first four rows, then we can put that too. We got rid of not Q. So we can not P, Q, or not R is there. But we got rid of that actually. If you join the that step, then we can get rid of not get on. We can not put that. When your cursor is, that is mm -hmm. actually not P or Q or not R. No. Yeah. We just limit our personification, which is, this is not necessary. We can get rid of that. So if you include that not R in there, then we oh, not I see what R. I mean. So it will be done. Mm, I'm not sure. Or whether you can just add something and it will still be equivalent. We just think if we do it, we just say don't make way. that. The if we don't make that simplification, but don't make that simplification, right? Then you can use the R. So it's like you removed it, so you just put it back in instead of removing. So that you can do it. Because yeah, earlier you said we don't need the R in there, like. Oh, I see. It. Thank you. Much. Okay. Question? No. Okay. All right. So let me read the rest of the question. Yep. So that's the entire question. So this part is about Boolean algebra because we are trying to simplify what we derived from the truth table into the CNF that we see here. I'm still trying to figure out how to get rid of the not Q. So not Q, if I use resolution, it can resolve with not P or Q. So that resolution will get rid of, would, would make a result of just not P or not R with not Q gone. <clears throat> but resolution only goes in one direction. It's an implication. It only goes in one direction. It does not go back in the opposite direction. Or maybe it does. I just have to prove that too. <laughs> yeah. Last time I, I think it does go back the other way. <laughs> Can you confirm the coordinates? Hmm? Can you confirm the coordinates? Yes. All right. So assuming the resolution goes the other way around you know, as well, then you know it's easy to, ex easy to explain how we get this and how we can get that one too. All right, moving ahead. And then the last one is you know, resembling your homework assignment, except this one is a lot simpler. <laughs> First of all, um, if you look at sign, which is everything that is known to be true, it is a CNF already. You don't have to do a single thing to turn it into a CNF. I put in the extra pair of parentheses just to confuse you. <laughs> <laughs> Is a very <clears throat> futile attempt to, to, to confuse. And then you look at phi, right? Phi is the proposed theorem. The first thing you need to do is to negate it first before you turn it into a CNF. So what do you do once you negate phi? It's already a CNF. Yeah. Already. It's like, oh, so there's no, no conversion that I need to do. 
So now the question is um, to do the resolution. How do you perform the resolution? So if you and what is the conclusion? It's not going to be seen if anyone. No. Say again? If you negate it, it's not going to be seen if anyone. It is a CNF. See, not phi is not not. <laughs> oh, so that first term is not? Yeah. I thought it's like highly negated. Okay. Yeah, so this cancels out. So not phi is automatically a CNF already. So the first negation is part of phi? Yeah. Oh, so. Yep. So now, now that you have a super CNF, it's just time to do resolution. And this time we only got three variables, okay? So with three variables in the worst possible case, how many um, ways can I arrange for the disjunctions? Remember how we do this calculation? Each variable can be present, can be negated, can be absent in a disjunction. So there are three poss possibilities for each variable. There are three variables here. So how many disjunctions can I generate out of these three variables, just total? It'll be three times three times three. There are three ways for P to appear in the disjunction. There are three ways for Q to appear in the disjunction. There are three ways for R to appear in the disjunction. So it's three times three times three, which is only 27, okay? It's not too bad. But we are not gonna experience all 27 because each one of these disjunctions only start with two variables to begin with. So after a resolution, you're guaranteed to have two or less fewer your variables left. So let's do this, okay? So we'll go ahead and use the vertical format, which I find a little bit easier to work with. So we have not P or not R. We have Q or R. We have P or not Q. And then we have not Q or R. And then we have Q or not R. Okay, so let's do some resolution here. Um, Okay, first of all, is there a possibility that we can turn, we can get to the contradiction? I think there's a chance, okay? I see there's a chance to do it. Um, so we look at the first one, so we'll number this one, two, three, four, five. Number one and number three can resolve, and that would become not Q or not R. Okay, so not Q or not R, and it's by resolving number one and what, number three, okay? And then number one can resolve with number four. Then we get not P or not Q, not P or not Q, okay? So not P or not Q, that's one and four. All right, so I'm done with one. Start with two. Two and three can become P or R, okay? So we have P or R using two and three, double checking. So Q goes away, P, R left, okay? So that's good. Um, two and four can also resolve to just R. Oh, nice. And so two, four. And then we have two, six. Yep, two, six can also resolve, but it's meaningless because you know, when those two resolve, so when two and six resolve, we have R or not R, um, or we have Q or not Q, pick one, okay? Because you know, they're both true. So that means you know, it's not helpful to us, okay? It's not something that's helpful. So we have two again, um, this time against, uh, seven, so we have not P or R, not P or R is not here yet, okay, so we have um, not P or R, yeah, go ahead. Can we apply um, absorption when we derive the R, so if well, R turns to go away, then we have two and four, which gives you Q and not Q, so it is uh, the next time. Well, the question says, you know, you, know, you only use your know, resolution, so let's not use absorption. But there's no need to use absorption either. I mean, you know, it, it simplifies things a little bit, but that's all it buys you is simplification. So, um, so we have not P from 
seven, right? Two and seven. Is that right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have two, seven, done, two, eight. Cannot do anything with it. Two, nine, cannot do anything. Two, ten, cannot do anything. So now we start with three. Or for those of you who look at this and go like, hmm, if you have a different idea and go like, I can see how we can get to the end quickly, you can go ahead and suggest it. Otherwise, I'm just going to go, go systematic and start with three. No, no one has any idea. Okay, so we'll start with three. So three versus four does not work. Three versus five does work. It's P or not R. P or not R is not here yet. So P or not R by combining three and five. Three, five, yep, okay. Three, six does not work. Three, seven does work, but then we just get P or not Q back. So it's not new. P8 does not work. P9 does not work. P10 does work. Then we have not R. Okay, nice. Um, if you did, uh, six. Seven. Hmm? You would get Q or Okay, so we are looking at three and seven. Yeah. So three, seven, we'll just get not Q back. Right. Oh, okay, that works. Okay, so let's erase that. Okay, three, seven, we get not Q. And then the other one, which is not R. I really like the not R because we got R here already, right? So that's three and what? I cannot remember. Yes. Three and this is three, and we want to have not. Well, no, that, that cannot be. Hmm? I cannot remember. I combine three with something and only end up with one variable. I cannot remember which one then. Has to have a not Q in it. Five, seven. No, it is. Oh, okay. I, I I think I read incorrectly. Okay, never mind. My bad. My bad. Okay, so okay. So three and ten can also work, right? Three ten. We get um not Q or R. Not Q or R. It's already here, so that doesn't count. But if you use five and Two and five. Hmm? Two and five. Two and five? Yes, and then you will have Q. Two, five. Did I miss that earlier? I did. Two, five. Yeah, I missed that. I should have discovered that one here. I did not follow my nested loop very well, did I? <laughs> Yeah, because I made that assumption. So if I miss something, it would I would not it would not occur to me to go back to check those steps. Yep. All right. So now we have twelve and thirteen combining to a false, and we're all done. There we go. So as a result, you have to make a conclusion and, and say that because the super CNF you know is false, it means the phi is um, imply the by sign. So, okay, so just write it here. Phi is implied by side, which is basically saying it is a DOL. Yep. And it's max, if it does, if it is, uh, if you can go through the max is what, 20, is it 3, 20, 20, 20? Yeah, 27. At the most. At the most. But you cannot even get to 27 because you can you you're gonna miss the ones with all three variables for sure. So it's so if you miss all the ones with three variables, there are how many of those? Aha, that's another good question, right? So how many disjunctions would involve all three variables? Like P or Q or R is one, P or P or Q or not R is one. So how many do we have 
that involve all three variables. It's just you know who is negated and who is not negated. Right? Exactly. No, it's not. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> you almost got me there. No, it is not nine, but you're pretty close. <laughs> So you're also three. pretty close in this case in a different way. It is eight. Do you, do you see how eight is close to nine because it's off by one? Eight is also close to 18 because it's also off by one in terms of the digit not, should not be, be there. How is it eight, right? I mean, that's the question. How, how is it eight? Because P can be there and or be negated, right? So two choices for P. For every choice of P, Q can be there as itself or negated. So two, two times two, right? For each way to arrange P, Q, R can, is the same way. So R is either there by itself, as itself, or negated. And hence it is two times two times two, which is eight. So now you have 27 minus eight, which is 19. So the worst case scenario is, you have like 19 of these things. So we work up to 14 already. <laughs> we only like five shy of it. So anyhow, yep. On the, on our exam, are you going to specifically banish absorption? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, in this one, I did not say anything about absorption. So without mentioning that absorption can be used, uh, the question said, you know, we can only use resolution. So, um, if we can stop at step nine, it's, it, we can conclude at step nine. Hmm? We can conclude with absorption at step nine. So, step nine can help eliminate a bunch of stuff, right? So, using nine, you can use that as an absorption and go like, we don't need this, we don't need this, we don't need this, we don't need this. So, it helps, it cleans things up a little bit, you know? Um, but you still need to perform your know, additional resolution. Uh, it's just a bit absorbed and it does make, it clear things out a little bit. Makes it, it makes it easier. Yep. But if you clear, clear two, you would have to derive more because you used two to get zero to the end. If you used absorption on the uh, number two, mm -hmm. you would lose it. So you wouldn't be able to, Get to 13. Yeah, get to 13. Yep. All right. I, I, I personally would just stick with resolution. I'm just going to stick with resolution and keep pairing and matching until I'm done with it. Yep. So, so if you apply 9 to 5, you'll get okay. Q. 9 to 5. Okay. Yeah. And then 9 to 6, you get an 8 to Q. Yeah, there are multiple ways to get to the conclusion. So we can be picky. Hmm? So we can be picky based on which the rows. You can optimize yeah, you the path. Loop third. Yes. So the idea is, you know, you're starting in Sacramento. I want you to get to Los Angeles. If you want to take Highway 1, the scenic route, and just, you know, enjoy this you know, ocean view, be my guest. Yeah, you want to travel up to Canada and then back to the town. <laughs> or if you have a self-driving car and just go like, you know, I can sleep for another five or six or seven hours. You just let your Tesla drive you, you know, until it runs out of juice and then you go recharge and sleep some more. I mean, when when do you think Tesla will make, you know, self-recharging stations? So your Tesla can pull into the recharge your station and recharge itself without you ever having to do a single thing. You can sleep the entire trip all the way down to Los Angeles. Unless it's self-charging cars. Exactly. You just need the charge station to, to be actuated, right? You know, so that yeah. the charge plug, you know, there's a robotic arm to put the charge plug into the charge port. And that can be probably easy because you can put um, optical encoding you know, around the charge port and it can be infrared, which means you know it doesn't have to mess up what you see on the car because what is IR black may not be visible like you know, black and vice versa. So you can basically just have your car to drive until it needs to recharge. And you can even set, you know, okay, I only want you to this 
fifty percent because you don't want to discharge all the way because that affects you know, how many cycles you have left you know, for recharging your vehicle. You can say, okay, discharge up to 50, down to fifty percent at the most, and then go recharge yourself. And meanwhile, I'm gonna go take a nap here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It'll probably be some kind of adapter or robotic arm with the, the optical system. Because yeah. They have a big charging network already, and they wouldn't want to throw that to the wayside and put out new chargers. And then when you wake up, you might find, you know, like there are six, you know, full-size pickup truck dually, so you're, you're blocking your way out <laughs> so the question just because is, they want to. Can you trust the synthetic car that much that you can relax the sleep in the car? Can you trust it that much? No, it is not legal in sure. California yet. I don't think California allowed your self driving cars yet, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, the wheel. Yeah, you have to be there. Do you have to be conscious at the time? Okay. Well, I have heard of car accidents involving the, the vision based you know, system. So I wouldn't trust it entirely. I would definitely be at least you know, mindful that the car is driving itself, but still be conscious and kind of pay attention. Yep. All righty. We are about five, three minutes short, but I'm gonna let you guys out soon. Um, so try to study as much as you can, because you know if I get any requests before Wednesday, I can customize the recorded lecture on Wednesday to address no issues or questions that you might have. Otherwise, it's going to move on and continue to talk about counting and discrete product derivatives in the recorded lecture on Wednesday. Okay. No questions tomorrow. Hmm? No questions tomorrow. Say this by tomorrow. By tomorrow, I would say maybe noon time because I have evening class tomorrow. So by the time I get home, I will be kind of prepared and I probably don't want to make it any more difficult. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Yeah. I'll see you guys next Monday. Yeah. What do we need to do with like the answer? Like, how do we or how do we use like this information to okay. get the final so, decision? Let me uh, let me stop the recording first because it's not related to its class.